Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, today we are visiting with Chelsea Erdman, and we are going to be talking about finding your role on family operations. So Chelsea has deep roots in agriculture and is really passionate about the legacy piece that comes with ranching. And she also has a knack for storytelling and sharing online. So Chelsea is located in North Dakota, and she currently works on her family's multi-generation diversified agriculture operation. And that was a mouthful, but she will get into how many generations or which generation she is, how many generations work on the farm, as well as all that they have going on. And we're really going to dive into how she went about finding her role on the family operation, how her family continues to navigate that with everyone who's working with them, whether that's family members or employees. And yeah, even talking about setting boundaries with family, if there can be such a thing, sometimes that seems challenging, but It's really a great episode. I'm excited to bring Chelsea's perspective to all of you. And so after you finish listening to the episode, if you are not already following Chelsea, head to Instagram and Facebook. And she also has a website and that is all under Oh That's Chelsea. And that information will all be in the show notes as well. So before we dive into the conversation, I want you to remember that I am booking speaking gigs for 2024. So whether you are looking for a keynote, a workshop, or a panelist, I cover a wide variety of topics, um, including how and why to bet on yourself, breaking societal standards, starting a podcast, um, using your voice because it is so powerful and it can impact others along with entrepreneurship in agriculture. So with that, you can head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com and simply send me a message off the website and we can chat there. But with that, let's hear from Chelsea. All right, Chelsea. Well, it is great to have you on the podcast. I know I usually run into you at uh, events here and there in North Dakota. And uh, so it's fun to actually have you on the show. You've been on my list for a while and I'm excited to talk about how your story and how you kind of found your role on your family operation and of work to set maybe family and work boundaries too, just because these are important topics for everyone out there in the beef industry. Well, I'm so thankful to be here and for your invite, and I'm really excited to get into this. Yeah. So to start off, I know I've had the privilege of knowing your family for ever, it seems like through Stockman's or whatever it may be, but can you kind of talk to your listeners a little bit about what your family operation looks like today? Because you guys are a diversified operation. Yes. I feel like sometimes this is the hardest question to even get through is who are you and what do you do? I am the sixth generation on our family farm that was started in 1893. And throughout the years, it has grown and diversified to make income streams more readily available when things are tough. And that has been very interesting from a business perspective to hear my parents talk about and my grandparents talk about how can we be resilient. So with that said, we are cow-calf and then my parents finish all of the calves background through finish straight to the packer at the feedlot on the farm. We're also row crop farmers. So we grow seed oats, pinto beans, soybeans, and corn. A lot of the corn is fed through the feedlot and then also sold. My parents have a mill on the farm that they run a feed business with and supply feed to the feedlot. And then my husband and I, mostly my husband, he works at our yard and has a pipe and sucker ad business that he sells for fencing supplies. So that is kind of a gamut of what days look like at the farm. You do have a lot going on there. I'm just taking some notes because there's even some stuff there that I did not realize as well, which makes sense. I mean, especially, I mean, diversification is the big thing when we talk about different revenue sources and streams. Um, It's not a new topic for agriculture and it's something, it's very much a common theme when you look at operations that are able to have multiple generations on them at one time and continue to pass them down to, like you said, be resilient through tough times. So with that, how many, so you said you're the sixth generation, how many generations are currently working on the farm or a part of the farm? Because I know your kiddos are a big part of the farm too, even though they're little. 
Yes. So I bring my kids with every day and my grandpa died last October. So up until last October from January of 2019 through October of 2022, we had four generations working together every day. And that just meant the most to me. I'm still getting teary thinking about it. That was, that was so special for a family. And yeah, now there's three of us. So my parents, um, my brother is also farming myself. And then I bring my kids all day, every day. And it is until you bring your kids, it's, it's really special. So that's something we're thankful for. Yeah. So it's, and your husband's still involved in that too. And you said one of your brothers is back, right? Yes. I have two brothers. One is farming and ranching full-time with us. And when I say with us, I mean, we can get into this later, but the way that we have things set up is different than most. Um, My husband comes on big days, but it has been less and less as his business has grown. So for the most part, he's doing his business. We're doing our business at the farm. They don't cross very often. So why don't you talk about that now? Because you said you're set up different than most. You mean like business structure, you're set up different than most? Or what do you mean by that? Yes. So when we came back to the farm, my brother and I had the privilege to start when my grandma and grandpa decided to semi-retire. So I was running cows with my parents while also working a full-time job at a nearby deer dealership. My grandparents decided to retire. So we were able to rent some land and buy some land in the spring of March. It was March, 2018. So we came back then, my brother and I, and rather than doing things as a partnership or rather than doing things um, percentages, we all work together, but run separate businesses. So I have my own fields, my own cows, my brother, the same, my parents, the same. So when we make decisions about what varieties to plant, how we want to do fertilizer, that is all on our own, which has been really great because we have a lot of big ideas and it has given us the freedom to try things on our own keeping in mind that it has to work for the farm. So I would never plant something that doesn't work for the farm as a whole, but I do have some freedom to do what I'd like, try what I'd like on my own fields, my own cows. Yeah, that is, I appreciate you walking through how you are set up like that, because I think that is one of the challenges when you have multiple generations working together is when everyone is a part of it and has some sense of ownership, you know, we want to try different ideas and having the freedom to do that is important in our everyday lives and our businesses. So thank you for walking through that. So I guess what, you know, you talked about how you had a job before you came back to the farm, but I want to back up even more. What did your involvement look like on the farm growing up? Because I know for so many people, you hear some stories where like, you know, maybe myself, I've always been involved with ranch work. It was in a sense expected and I just grew that passion grew on me and I chose to continue doing it. And there are other people who grew up on farms and ranches, but they weren't really even involved as kids, but still came back to it. So what's your story or what did your involvement look like on the farm growing up? We were kind of in between. We lived at the farm until I believe I was four or five ish and then we moved to a farm that was two miles away so it was always close but you were never looking out your back window when the tractors came in or when they were working on stuff in the backyard it was not like that it was always on a different place so that was interesting and I distinctly remember the first day that I got to drive the grain cart we were having supper the night before and my dad was letting my mom know that he had no one to drive it the next day and I believe I was 12 and I volunteered and it was kind of this moment of I honestly hadn't thought of you, hadn't considered you, possibly because you're only 12. It's not like you're just around the yard and we can say, hey, we need you come over here right now. And that's how it got started. I started running the grain cart when I was 12 before I could drive anything. And it grew from there, which we can also get into. My abilities are not mechanically inclined at all. When when things break, that is not my general area of expertise. So working my way up from the bottom, from the mechanical side, um, servicing equipment, taking care of equipment, that just does not click the same way for my brain as the financial side, running it as a business, thinking through how can we do things differently. So working my way up has been different than I would say traditionally it looks like for people that come back to a farm. 
it, talk through that, like as far as like your roles, what you're doing on the operation today and how that's different, how you worked your way up. So I say the word work or the phrase work my way up with a grain of salt. So we all have put in our time differently. We all have different strengths. And I think that sometimes it's easy to get hung up on, did you start at the bottom and work your way up or have you come in a side door or have you worked your way in differently than working your way up? So it's kind of on the cow side too. We grew up with short-term cows. My parents or my dad and my grandpa got sick when I was young. So they sold their keeper herd and then we just got short-term cows. Calving short-term cows is very different than calving a, a herd that you keep forever. So that was something that we learned growing up and working into it. And some of us enjoy the cows more and some of us enjoy the farm more. So we just worked our way in I would say to the business differently. We do not have the same qualifications. We did not have the same ladder rungs to climb in and say, okay, you have achieved this level at the farm. It is not structured at all like a typical business in town would possibly structure their climbing the corporate ladder. So with that, when you, so I guess first, maybe more question to not skip in between when you were working at the dealership, were you still involved on the farm, even when you had a full-time job? Yes, I was. Yes, it was the most incredible opportunity for a job that I could possibly have had. I was able to come home. I lived with my parents, and I bought a bunch more cows on my own, and I ran them with my parents while I was working the job. So they would allow me to come in at 6 in the morning and leave at 2. I ran the grain cart full-time during harvest and I worked from the tractor while driving the grain cart. Um, it was comp time. So there were days that I would be at the dealership 12, 14 hour days, but then later would make up for it working from the tractor. They were so gracious to me and so good. So that's how I was able to take my cows, lived with my parents, built equity. And then when it was time to leave the dealership, I had something. Okay. So then with that, did you feel like you already knew where your role was by the time March of 18 rolled around and you had your opportunity to come back to the operation, like you said, with your brother and have a more full-time role? I'm so glad you asked this because it was quite the learning curve. When I was working at the dealership, I would go to the dealership um, and then work. And it, I wouldn't always get done at two. Some days it would be four. Some days it would be seven. Some days it would be really long days. But when we were calving, I tagged with my dad every day. When we were harvesting, I was there every day. I went to the farm and worked every day after working at the dealership. However, I was not at the farm all day, every day. So when I transitioned to being at the farm all day, every day, it's completely different. What I thought I knew is not what I knew. The way that the day flows, the decisions that you have to make, I thought I knew what was going on, and I learned a lot being immersed in it all day, every day. It, it's def definitely different. So how, you know, has your family had different conversations about who should kind of be in charge of what or focus on what areas, or how have you each gone about falling into your roles. I know there can be some transitions and like you said, a learning curve, but what did that kind of look like for you guys? Because like you said, you're not mechanically inclined. You like kind of the number side of it, or there might be other pieces of it. And so I guess, how have you worked with your family to kind of make sure everyone's in their area of genius in a sense? This is a work in progress. Definitely not we are not at the destination. We are still figuring it out. Like I said, my grandpa just passed away October of 22. So there was still a dynamic of him retiring in 18, my dad fully stepping into the chief of chiefs role, which he doesn't like when I say that, but he <laughs> is our incredible leader and someone has to be the leader and it's him. And he, the things that he thinks about that we just don't even know yet because he has experience and been there. So we were shifting from him and my grandpa doing it together to him doing it and now bringing us in. And this is something I would say is taking time. And I don't feel like we're not going fast enough or we're going too fast. It's just a process that I didn't realize 
would take time to figure out as we're going. And it's not something that needs to be rushed, not something that we need to have definitively on paper. It can be a work in progress and be okay. And I, I meant to ask this earlier, but I forgot. Um, do you have other employees on your operation as well, or is it solely family? Yes, we also have other employees. So that is another dynamic that has been interesting. Talk about how they, I'd be curious to hear how you work them into everything with everything that's going on or, you know, what their roles are with everything that's going on as well. I would say their roles are more defined. They have their strengths and we try to do a good job of setting them up for success. So if this is something that this person is really good at, we'll leave them there and we'll use ourselves to bounce around and fill in the gaps rather than bouncing employees around. And that's been really fun to see them thrive and grow when they're given consistency. And they are a huge part of our operation. It would be very difficult to do what we do without them. So we're very thankful. Okay. So as you continue to work to kind of like you said, it's a continuous process finding your role on a family operation. And as you continue to navigate that, how do you work through the learning process of, yes, this is something I should maybe pursue or continue to work towards and improve the skill set? Or maybe that's just something where on a different business side, we'd say, nope, I'm going to outsource that. How do you approach that as you continue to grow as a rancher? Another good question, because I feel like we all look at it differently. I am a much faster outsourcer because I think my time at the dealership showed me follow your strengths, do what's really great, find someone else to do the rest. However, living in rural America and having the resources that we have, it's easy to say that we should outsource this. But when it comes to actually getting it outsourced, can we find someone to do it? If we can, will it work out? Can we hit the 70% threshold of if they can do it 70% as good as I can, it's worth it. It has been very difficult to find people that want to do the work and then enjoy doing the work, stay doing the work and do a good job doing the work. So again, a work in progress and we all, we all look at it differently. So that's a conversation we have often is should we continue down this path? Should we try something else? Is there an option that we have not considered yet that would eliminate this question? And then we could move forward without even having to worry about it. So those are conversations we have all the time at lunch. Well, and I, I appreciate you being honest about how there's not an answer. You know, there's no magic ticket in that something that or silver bullet, however you want to say it, just because that's something that we face as ranchers and it depends on the operation. It depends on your location. It really depends on your resources. So I appreciate your honesty with that. Folks, today is a new day in animal health care, and MedGene is shining bright. MedGene has been a key innovator in the field of platform vaccine technology. MedGene enables veterinarians to put platform vaccines to work for the animals in their care. Swine, cattle, and companion animals all stand to benefit. It's time to talk to MedGene. It's a new day in animal health care. You can learn more about MedGene, the company, as well as what platform vaccine technology is by going to medgenelabs.com com or even better yet follow medgene on linkedin so another thing i want to talk about is what made your operation enticing for you to come back to was it just that you've always been passionate about it was it because you knew that it was going to be a successful business like or that you enjoyed working with family what made your operation enticing to come back to and i'm asking because i think you know, I see statistics that roll around on Instagram reels and on the internet and other conversations about how the age of the rancher is increasing and young people don't want to come back. And I think there are a lot of factors leading up to that. But I do think one of the factors that we don't talk about enough is creating operations that are enticing to come back to. So what made your operation enticing for you to come back to? Personally, it was the legacy. The farm means so much to me it's almost like another family member, like a standalone, I love the farm that much. And when I was at the dealership, I wanted to be involved on the farm and it just wasn't the right time. So we did the cows and the dealership at the same time to bridge the gap. 
And it became apparent that what I was building at the dealership was incredible. I felt incredibly supported. It was a great opportunity, but it was building a legacy for someone else. And the pull to go home to work on our family's legacy was so strong. And it, it wasn't about the hours or the money or the lifestyle. It was truly the legacy that this has been in our family for six generations. And then after being back and having kids, it was like, how could I not give this opportunity to my kids? Is there a better way to raise them? And for me personally, this is the best. This I'm so thankful for the opportunity that they are immersed in this legacy, in family, in the values of agriculture. So that's what it means to me. And that's why I came back. Okay. So then with that, shifting gears a little bit, I want to touch on the family and work-life boundaries, because sometimes that can be a challenge on family operations. I work with my parents and I also work with my in-laws and my husband. So how has your family, if at all, kind of worked to establish any boundaries between work and family time to, ooh, I mean, I know they intertwine, but just to still maintain that good family relationship, even through hard times on the operation. I think the key phrase there was, if at all. And that has been part of the reason that I bring my kids every day is how could I manage? And we used to live 40 miles from the farm. So I would drive 40 miles to the farm at the beginning of the day and drive 40 miles back at the end of the day. How could I possibly drop my kids off at daycare, drive the 40 miles, work the farm hours, go pick my kids up and then go home? I would never see my kids. So that's part of the reason I brought them with. And we have the mindset that we don't have to have separate work time and family time. It's all just family time and we enjoy work. So we look forward to working. We don't really have any hobbies pursuing the farm, growing the farm, that is such a gift that we have just made it all into one, that we don't have to have boundaries. And sometimes it's hard, but for the most part, it's been an attitude that my parents have instilled in us that this is a lifestyle that we love and we want to live, so we don't have to go find time away. We go to church on Sundays, but otherwise, we're happy to be at the farm together. Well, I appreciate you saying that you're parents instilled that in you and am I correct in saying that that was probably something that was passed down generationally if you are the sixth generation yes I would think so my grandparents were also homebodies that enjoyed being on the farm my grandpa's hobbies were farming being being with Mm -hmm. the cows being at the farm driving the ranger around yes finding joy in where we were so we've touched is there anything else you want to talk about when it comes to finding roles in family operations that we haven't hit on already? I don't think so. Just that we are definitely a work in progress. And I very much enjoy hearing from other people, how they have found their groove and how it has continued to evolve, how everyone has found a place. It's very interesting because there are no two farms or ranches that I've found that are doing it the same way. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to shift a little bit and talk about what you do on social media and you also have notebooks, right? To help record family history that you sell. Yes. Yes. So talk a little bit about that air, that part of your life and how it ties into the farm. So the very beginning of this goes back extremely far When we would go to a big town, we would go into a large grocery store or a Walmart and my dad would go to the meat department and my mom would go get all the rest of the things that we would need. And while at the meat department, my dad would just browse and see as a consumer, what do consumers see on the shelf for beef? And that was fascinating to him because he was a meat judger. We have cow calf, we finish. So what does a consumer see versus what does the rancher see? And inevitably, Every single time he would help a lady or someone pick out meat to take home. It was a one-to-one touch, and it was bridging the gap between ranchers and consumers way long ago before we talked about this all the time. And that was the foundation of how we advocate for agriculture. That was another principle that my parents instilled in us is to bridge the gap, be with people, talk to people, make connections. So. 
on social media, I believe it was Ellen DeGeneres was talking about how beef wasn't safe for the planet. And I made a video and then it has just turned into a passion project of we need to continue to tell our story. We're very lucky to be, or back when I lived 40 miles from the farm, I was lucky to live next to the Vamadaf Dairy. And Connie Vamadaf is an incredible advocate for agriculture. And she told a story about how a reporter called her house one day and asked to do a story. And she said, no comment. The reporter said he was going to publish the story anyways. And she said that that was a moment for her that showed they will tell our story if we don't. And that pulled at me a lot that we need to contribute to the story to make sure that it's correct and we are giving our full two cents. So anyways, that was a long story to get into why I share on social media, but it's a passion project. We do that. As for the books, every January 1st or New Year's Eve, December 31st, we play a game called Hokey Pokey where we see if we'll have luck, money, or a good crop the next year. And then my mom would take notes in a cinegraphic notebook. And it is really neat to look back and flip through how the years have gone. So we just made a fancy book. It's like a baby book for your farm that you do as a family. You fill out your notes. And then when you're done, you'll have 10 years, a whole decade of a place that you have memories from the farm. Easy to look back on, easy to put in a safe, put with a photo albums, a family heirloom for the farm. What? You know, that in itself is a great way to help pull the legacy piece together and the family piece of any family operation. But what other advice do you have for people who want to continuously work to strengthen those family bonds on their operation? I think it's spending time together. And like I said earlier, finding the joy in our work, that there will be hard days but at the end of the day we all leave together in the beginning of the next day we all come together in 2019 for harvest when we had all that rain and all that snow we had to put tracks in our combine and it was the most awful harvest that we have all been through the most awful weaning season we've all been through my dad said something about the joy that my first kid brought for us and it was just like a great reminder that we're here because of our family. We're not here because of the land or the animals or the legacy, but it's the people. And that was a great reminder. So we're lucky that we have kids as a reminder in front of us all the time of this is why we're doing this because someone did it for us. And now it's our turn to do it for someone else because the farm is never really ours. It's our turn to take care of it, to pass it on to the next. Awesome. Well, Chelsea, before we wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to share that we haven't touched on? There are days that could be extremely difficult working with family. And I think we all smile when we hear that. And at the same time, it is such an incredible gift. The amount of time that I have been able to spend with my parents as an adult, my grandparents as an adult, my kids, it is something that is, is just such an incredible gift. You see things um, on Instagram or Facebook that says you have 18 summers with your kids. You know, by the time they're X amount old, you've already used up 90% of the time you'll spend with them. And that's just not how agriculture is for us. We are so lucky and blessed to work together and have this time. And I think it's such a gift. So that's what makes agriculture special to me. Well, I really appreciate you being open and honest in this conversation today and sharing your story and advice to help others who are out there and trying to find their roles on family operations. Thank you for having me. This was fun. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.